Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon. We take your calls. If you have questions you'd like to call in with, you can ask them here. We can talk about them. Um, if you have a different viewpoint from the host, want to talk about that, you can call about that as well. The number to call is 844-484-5737. Right now, the lines are not completely full. We have some lines open, so you might want to call early. 844-484-5737. Our first caller today is Nathan from Vacaville, California. Nathan, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Um, I was just thinking this morning about uh, um, the statement that uh, I hear people say all the time, um, God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross. And often I, I get the sense that that is understood to mean that, you know, God took sort of all of his anger at sin, you know, my sin, your sin, and all of our sin, and, and then redirected it at Jesus. But I, I'm, I have a hard time with that. I'm wondering if there's another sense. It, to me, the idea that God pouring out his wrath on Christ, you know, I, I don't know that that's what it means. I don't think the Bible exactly says that that's what it means, but that's kind of what is assumed that it means. And I was just wondering if you had a had an understanding of, of that statement and, and what that might be. Well, the Bible doesn't specifically use that terminology that God poured his wrath mm -hmm. out on Christ. Uh, it does say in Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. Uh, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is, our sins, uh, he's, it says, were laid upon him. And uh, 1 Peter tells us the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 2, where it says um, in verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. But these these only tell us that God put our sins upon Jesus. They don't specifically mention uh, God's wrath, though that was kind of, I think, the understanding behind the old sacrificial system, uh, which was a type and a shadow of Christ, that uh, the animal that was being offered had hands laid upon it, which was symbolic of the uh, transfer of the sin of the worshiper to the animal. And then the animal was, of course, killed uh, and suffered, therefore, the penalty of sin. Now, again, it that would qualify many statements in the scripture, justify many statements in the scripture that says Jesus died uh, in our place, he carried our sin, he bore our sin, and so forth. But the idea of God's wrath being poured out on Jesus is not a specifically uh, Christian uh, biblical statement. It is it is a common Christian saying uh, to illustrate the fact that God's anger towards sin, uh, which would have been directed against us for our sins, has now been directed toward Jesus because he bore our sin. But uh, the language isn't exactly the, the language of Scripture. Uh, was, there, was there something about it that you specifically were oh, concerned about? I don't know. I, 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 you know, I, I, I've sort of thought for a long time, you know, about this idea, many years, about the, this idea that, uh, um, uh, you know, God... You know, Christians often say things like, you know, God turns his back on Christ, um, you know, on the cross. God rejected Jesus and, and you know, on the cross, and, you know, Jesus became... Even her well, the idea... Like, the the Jesus, idea... Of, being on the cross, things like that. Yeah, the, the idea that Jesus, uh, that God turned his back on Jesus when Jesus was on the cross, uh, again, the Bible doesn't state that clearly. In Psalm 22... One, we have the statement that Jesus quoted on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is largely, I think, the basis for saying, well, God must have forsaken Jesus when he was on the cross. Though there are some uh, theologians who believe that G God didn't really forsake him any more than he really forsook David, who, who originated those words. Sometimes a person feels so God forsaken that they might cry out like that, uh, when in fact... God has not. In fact, David uh, goes on later in the psalm and says to, to God, you will not leave me. You know, you won't abandon me. Uh, so, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes preachers have taken certain statements in Scripture, which do uh, perhaps, in some cases, imply certain things, like that God turned away from Jesus when he was on the cross, and they make that a, a dramatic preaching point. And uh, then when you go looking for the actual scriptures that say those words, 
<clears throat> or something equivalent to them, a lot of times they're not easily found. Uh, but I do believe, I mean, some people feel like it's uh, unlike God to pour out his wrath on his own son. Uh, but the, the idea that Christians have generally taught about this is that Jesus was not being punished so much for, certainly not for being his son, but for being uh, sin impersonated, or personified, I should say, in, in a man. Jesus took our sins upon him. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this, this idea that Jesus was bearing our sin, and our sin is worthy of God's wrath, and Jesus was punished in our place, and those, I mean, those statements have been what has uh, caused certain verbiage to become very common, I like to say that Jesus bore the wrath of God, or God poured out his wrath on Jesus. Uh, well, you know, the, wor the word wrath, uh, I don't know that it's really used that, uh, that frequently with reference to uh, our sins. Uh, it is used frequently in the Old Testament and some in the New Testament to speak of uh, God's wrath toward a society, like like Jerusalem when they were in rebellion against him. And no, I have no problem with the idea that he could have had wrath toward individual sinners. I mean, Paul said that we have not been appointed to wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to receive salvation. So that seems to speak of probably individual, uh, you know, susceptibility to wrath. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the language you're using, very common in the pulpits of evangelical churches. I was raised uh, hearing it a lot, too. But the specific language I don't believe can be found in Scripture. So if it if the language bothers you, then yeah, you don't really have a problem with Scripture. Now, if the concept of Jesus bearing our sins and our punishment bothers you, then you might have some problem with some of the Scriptures. Right. Yeah. You mentioned one of the passages that, that uh, sort of related to this idea the um, um, the idea that, that that Christ became sin for us. That's that's another one of those passages that that. I don't know exactly what to do with. I don't, you know, I, I, I know how a lot of Christians take it, but it's, it's, it's not clear. I don't think in the context. Paul makes it. Well, it's, it's, it only ma it makes no sense. It makes no sense except in the context of the sin offering, and uh, the whole reason yeah. that the whole reason there were sin offerings and and trespass offerings in the Old Testament system is to foreshadow what Christ would do. I mean, there's God. God had no pleasure in the blood of bulls and goats. The Bible says that, and it says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So why were they? Why were they commanded? Why were they practiced? Why did God insist on it? Mm. Well, because they were to point forward to something. They were a type and a shadow of Christ, just like the Passover lamb slain with the, and the blood put over the door and on the doorpost uh, was a Christ. Our Passover has uh, filled that role. So. These rituals of the Old Testament, especially that involved the killing and bloodshed of animals in sacrifice, was to depict to Israel the concept that would be ultimately realized in, in Christ doing that for us. So, um, yeah, to say that Christ became sin for us. Now, I will say this, the word sin that Paul uses there can be used in, in the Septuagint, the Old Testament sometimes is used for the sin offering. And so some translators or commentators feel that it should be translated, he who knew no sin became a sin offering for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But the words that Paul uses usually does mean sin, and it, it parallels the righteousness on the other part of the verse. He became sin, we became righteousness. It's interesting, he doesn't say he became sinful for us and we became righteous, but, uh, but we became righteousness we became the righteousness of God in him, and he became sin in our place. So it's a, it is interesting language, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just it has its background in the Old Testament uh, sacrificial system. All right, I appreciate your call. Let's talk to Mike from Albany, Oregon. Mike, how are you doing? Doing good. Hello, brother. Um, hey. I had a question uh, about Matthew 18, um, having to do with the, the authority to bind and, um, and loose. And mm -hmm. so in, in Matthew 18, it's, it's kind of unclear who Jesus is referencing, at least to my mind it is. Um, in Matthew 16, he's talking to Peter directly. But uh -huh. in Matthew 18, he talks about church discipline. And, um, you know, um, uh, if a brother sins against you, uh, eventually you take it to the church 
And then if he still refuses to repent, then um, let him be a Gentile. And then he says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So I was wondering, is that is that authority then, is he speaking of the church in general having that authority? Is he speaking of um, the disciples in verse 1? It's, it doesn't say if it's the 12 disciples or who it is exactly, but um, that's yeah. who he's talking to. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any insight on who he's referencing there in verse 18 when he says you. Yeah, I've always taken it uh, in the context to be the 12 that he's with on this occasion. Uh, he doesn't seem to be among okay. crowds, uh, though, of course, there were disciples besides the 12. Um, so it is possible. Um, so, I mean, it's possible that all Christians be involved. But he spoke it to Peter uh, and then to the apostles here. And I think that what he is suggesting, although there's been a lot of different opinions about what he's saying here, I believe he's saying that the apostles had uh, the unique authority in the in the body of Christ to determine the norms, what will and will not be allowed. Uh, and I, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure you're aware that the, the term binding and loose was a rabbinic term. Uh, the rabbis spoke right. about, uh, you know, binding or loosing things had to do with permitting or not permitting things where, where the law was ambiguous and one rabbi had one opinion and another, if one rabbi would uh, permit uh, an action that the other would forbid, where the law was ambiguous, uh, the one who was permitting it was said to be loosing it, and the one who was forbidding it was said to be binding it. So when Jesus tells the disciples, you'll bind and you'll loose, uh, I think what he's saying is, uh, as the rabbis had the role of interpreting and applying and determining what the norms would be in, in obedience to God and the law, that the apostles now play that role in the body of Christ, that they are the ones who would declare, you know, what is right and what's wrong. Now, they would do that based on what Jesus had said, but from time to time, uh, you know, the apostles would have to speak about something that Jesus hadn't talked about. For example, Paul, uh, who was not one of the 12, but was an apostle like the others, um, mm-hmm. He he said in First Corinthians seven that he had to give some instructions that Jesus had never spoken about to people who were married to unbelievers. Jesus had only addressed uh, people who were married within the same faith, Judaism. But now, because Paul evangelized Gentiles, some Gentiles got saved, but their spouse did not. And now there's a new situation Jesus hadn't spoken about. And so Paul says, uh, you know, I'm gonna have to give my judgment about this, and um, and he did. And, and so. In other words, the, the apostles had the authority and the assignment to teach <clears throat> the disciples what Jesus had said about, you know, normative Christian behavior. Uh, but they also had the authority, perhaps, to go beyond Jesus, where Jesus had been silent. Whatever the apostles said would be binding. And, um, you know, you probably have heard also that many translations rendered, I think the way you read it, um, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosen he- on earth will be loose in heaven. But it, actually in the Greek, it's whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. That's how it actually reads in the Greek. Some of the translations render it that way, and the ones that don't sometimes have a footnote to indicate that. I know the NIV does um, have a footnote. <clears throat> so the idea is it's not that you bind it and then heaven will say, okay, you said it, I'm going to back you up. Rather... They are binding on earth what has been bound in heaven. What God has already decided, they will be communicating to the church. They'll be enforcing uh, in the church that which God in heaven has already decided is so. Now, you ask, could it mean the whole church? You know, insofar as the church is, um, you know, true to the teaching of the apostles, uh, then the church, of course, Mm -hmm. also uh, does bind and loose Things and it might even be, although I wouldn't be 100 percent sure that that this is that this would give the church uh, in any any generation who the ones who are faithful at least to apostolic teaching the ability to even uh, you know declare on some things that that have not yet or were not really spoken of in Scripture um, or by the apostles. But I, that'd be an assumption that we couldn't really be sure of. I believe we can be sure, sure. of of uh, the apostles having that authority. And that's why, that's why the, the books that were chosen to be included in the New Testament had to have apostolic stamp 
They either had to be written by an apostle or by someone who was so closely associated by, with an apostle that it was assumed uh, they could not be in disagreement with the apostle. Or they, in, in fact, Mark, for example, who was uh, who traveled with Peter, or Luke, who traveled with Paul, uh, it is probable that neither of those books would be allowed to be written without the supervision and approval of Peter and Paul, respectively. Right. So that it was figured they have apostolic authority. Um, so, that, I mean, the apostolic role in the New Testament church was unique. I don't think there's ever another one. The uh, I know the Mormon church and the Catholic church, and maybe some others too, believe in something called apostolic succession, that there should be apostles mm -hmm. and uh, in every generation. But Paul said in first uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, <clears throat> and Christ is the chief cornerstone. But the foundation of the church was laid uh, 2,000 years ago, and uh, therefore they, they did serve as foundational members of the church, and they did set the norms. And fortunately, they wrote enough for us to know what it was they said and believed. Right, that, that makes sense. But because that phrase was right in there after talking about the uh, the church being able to make a decision, and then yeah. um, right before Maybe. two or three gathered in my name, I'm among you. I was just curious because it, uh, it doesn't have the the context as obvious as it does in uh, chapter 16. True. Well, that I, is true. I, I appreciate that. Okay, Mike, and let me just say about that context that it is even possible when Jesus said, where uh, two or more of you are gathered, there am I in the midst of you, that he could be saying two or more of you apostles, you know, in agreement. Oh, yeah. But uh, but it could mean to, to you know Christians are a gathered church because when Paul uh, set out to uh, uh, instruct about church discipline in First Corinthians five, uh, and he was not present in the church, but he said uh, when you when the whole church is come together and my spirit with you uh, in the name of Jesus deliver this man over to Satan. So it's like they were doing it uh, Paul as Paul's proxy. Paul was not there. But he said, when the whole church gathers together, my spirit will be with you in this. And, and therefore, he is suggesting they're doing it on his authorization. Uh, <clears throat> and I suppose that any church, any time, which is following faithfully what Paul or Peter or the other apostles or what Jesus said, would have the same authorization. His spirit would be with them in it. So I think could, perhaps a church could do that, too. Okay. Okay. Sense. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Always good to hear from you, Mike. Good hearing from you. Thanks. God bless you. Uh, Kay from uh, Maricopa, Arizona. Kay, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks uh, for calling. Yes, hello, Steve. Hi. I uh, was wondering if you might give me some insight biblically uh, in mentoring in our community today. There seems to be a great deal of issue regarding uh, medical marijuana, recreational mar marijuana. It's been passed here in Arizona most recently and being licensed. And I have already have gotten into discussions with people. They're seeking to find out the, the truth, and they're telling me, oh, of course, well, God said that he's made every green herb for our healing. And I said, well, there is more to it than, than just that. And I wondered if you might be able to share some scripture yeah. and some insight on such. Well, it doesn't say God made every green herb for our healing. It does say in Genesis 1 that he made every green herb for food. Um so I guess if you made a salad with marijuana, that'd be no. But of course, every green herb for food. Well, they eat it that now. They've been eating cakes and cooking. I know and they do, else, and, they, so. and they've done it. They've done it for for decades. Yeah, uh, I was joking about that because I mean it's clear that not every green plant is really to be ingested because it might have a damaging effect. For example, yeah. uh, let them let them dry and smoke uh, poison oak and see how that works <laughs> out. You know, uh, yeah. obviously it's a green herb, but uh, not all green herbs are healthy for us, but a lot of them are medicinal, of course. And uh, and marijuana could be seen as a medicinal herb. Some people do find a relief. Uh, but we have to understand that most people who want marijuana aren't wanting it because of their pain. They want it because they're drawn to recreational use of the drug. Yes. And, uh, and recreational use of the drug has only one purpose, and that is to get high. You know, now uh, there are, you know, you can, a Christian can take uh, medicines uh, for pain that have morphine in them. Uh, but if you, but if you take morphine just to get high, I think that that's, that's not what 
what we're supposed to do. I think that's pharmakia. I think that's a, a violation of what those things are for. Um, it seems like it. Yeah, I, I mean, if the Bible actually uh, warns against the overuse of uh, wine, and it certainly does. And you have and the yet, scripture on that handy? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 18, I think Paul says, be not drunk with wine. Uh, but also in Proverbs, it talks about uh, not not being given over to wine. Uh, it, uh, some people actually take this scripture to say you shouldn't have a you know you shouldn't drink wine at all, but I don't believe that's what the, the Bible's saying. Jesus, I'm, and everyone as else well as wine. that, I'm getting the other side of it. You know, if you're really feeling poor, it tells you to take wine for your for your belly for your stomach. Well, that's true. That's true. And there's 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 nothing you're, wrong. If you're in the, on your deathbed. I think it might have been recalled. Well, it there was in chapter thirty-one of Proverbs reference to giving it wine to yes. someone on the deathbed so they'd forget their misery. But also, Paul told Timothy to take a little wine just for his stomach uh, problems. His uh, he he apparently had amoebic dysentery or some other uh, dis, uh, th- something from drinking bad water. So Paul said, "Stop drinking water alone. Take a little wine with it for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities." So there is a medis- medicinal use for wine. I mean, when uh, it was an alcohol. It was one of the, probably the main form of alcohol uh, to, for people to use for medicinal purification and so forth. Uh, for example, the the uh, the good Samaritan, when he found the man who was bruised and wounded, he poured wine and oil into his wounds. That's medicinal treatment in those days. They didn't have you know pharmaceuticals, and you know I, I'm not fond of pharmaceuticals. But the point is, wine is treated in the scripture as something that is has medicinal value. But also something that if you have too much of it, you'll be uh, it'll it'll mess you up uh, spiritually and mentally, and we know I'm that's true. Finding the discussion where people are trying to blur the line, and I guess I was trying to. I understand the medicinal, but I guess what you, you probably hit the nail right on the head because you're talking about the recreational use, and it disturbed me because of if you're not in, let's say, if you're out of control, maybe bad choice of words. And a lot of other things can come into play if you're well, yeah, well, it because you're affected well, by the uh, ingredients of maybe medical marijuana or well, marijuana. Like you said, mar- marijuana is wine, more whatever. marijuana is more dangerous than people let on. Uh, there's a, a really good book that came out a, 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 a year or two ago called uh, "Tell Your Children the Truth About Marijuana," and uh, it's done by a journalist who who has all kinds of case studies that you don't hear about in the popular press of uh, the, the connection between uh, marijuana and uh, becoming psychotic. I think, uh, as I recall, it's like if you smoke marijuana, you are four times more susceptible to become psychotic. And, and there are a number of case studies. And this is not just, you know, this is not reefer madness, you know, like the, the movie they had when we were mm-hmm. teenagers. Uh, it's this is scientific studies, and uh, it's just the kind of stuff that is politically incorrect, and and the news doesn't want to tell you about, it. and because everyone, yeah, of course, everyone, you know the, the name ba- of the author. Uh, yeah, I don't remember his name, but he's been interviewed. Uh, he's written other books too on COVID and stuff like that. But okay, uh, thank just, you. Just you just look it up as tell. It's called Tell Your Children the Truth about Marijuana and Psychosis right. and stuff. So, and you'll find the book. That's a, that's a good book. But the point is, uh, there may be times. When uh, marijuana, like morphine and some other uh, drugs that can be very damaging, uh, taken in smaller doses can be helpful for someone who's in excruciating pain. And and so uh, the opioid epidemic epidemic we have right now is uh, often due to the fact that people get opioids prescribed for pain legitimately, but then they they get hooked on them or they, you know, they get sold on the street uh, just for getting high. And so... I mean, that's, a, that's marijuana, too. Marijuana can be uh, medicinal, probably, in some quantities. I've never smoked it myself but, uh, or eaten it. But the, the thing is, it's oh, – oh, his name is uh, – my, my wife looked up his name. The author is Alex Berenson. Alex? A-L-A-X-I-S? Ber- no, A-L-E-X, Alex uh, Berenson. So just, yeah, just look it up and you'll find it. I need to take another call, though. Thank you so much. I appreciate your input on this. This will help a great deal in our community. Thank you. All right. God bless you. Appreciate your call. Bye now. All right. Uh, We have to take a break at this point, and then we'll be back. We have another half hour ahead. 
So those who are waiting online, stay where you are, and we'll get to you uh, shortly. At this point, we every day want to let you know that The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry. You know, we went on the air 23 years ago, and we don't make any kind of big pitches for finance. We don't send out letters. We don't send out, uh, we don't have a mailing list, except to the people who've donated, and we just send them a, a receipt once a year. That's all they ever hear from us. So uh, no, no one who donates here uh, is going to be uh, flooded with uh, mail and uh, spam. And we don't give your names to anyone, we, uh, nor do we appeal. We, we make no appeals. We just let you know. If you like the program and you want to contribute to us paying for the airtime, you can write to us, and we want you to have the address. The address is The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. That's The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Uh, our website is thenarrowpath.com. You can donate from thenarrowpath.com also. The main purpose of The Narrow Path is not to solicit donations. We have hundreds of resources there, and none of them cost a penny uh, at thenarrowpath.com. I'll be gone for 30 seconds, and I'll be right back. The book of Hebrews tells us, do not forget to do good and to share with others. So let's all do good and share the narrow path with Steve Gregg with family and friends. When the show is over today, tell one and all to go to thenarrowpath.com where they can study, learn, and enjoy with free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all the Narrow Path radio shows. And be sure to tell them to tune into the show right here on the radio. Share listener-supported The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Share and do good. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour. We're taking calls, as we did in the previous half hour, from people who have either questions about the Bible or Christianity, or who might have a different viewpoint from the host and want to bring that up for conversation. If you fit into either of those two categories, you can call us at 844-484-5737. That's 844-484. 5737. Uh, just a few announcements before we go back to the phone lines. Uh, there's one announcement that uh, would be of perhaps interest to people nationwide or even globally uh, who, who go online. Uh, I'm going to be on a Zoom meeting, and it's open to, uh, to you to participate if you want to. Uh, once a month, there's a church in Oregon that conducts this meeting, and uh, they have me uh, oh, either answer questions or teach. I don't know what I'm doing this time. It's coming this Wednesday. I don't know if it's teaching or Q&A, but if you're interested, it's this Wednesday night at 7 Pacific time and and whatever other time it is in your time zone. Now, if you're interested in that Zoom meeting, you, you can find out how to log on to it uh, at our website, thenarrowpath.com, under Announcements. And uh, you can be anywhere in the world and join us on that uh, in that meeting. It happens once a month on Wednesday night, the first Wednesday of every month. Now, there's a couple other announcements that have to do with this Saturday for those who live in Southern California. Uh, for many, many years, we've been having a weekly men's meeting, uh, Bible study, in, in our home uh, on Saturdays. And these, uh, these have cut back to once a month, the first Saturday of each month, and they're moving to another location. Uh, so we can accommodate more people. Uh, and that's in a little church. It's the same little church where we have our Saturday night meetings in Temecula. It's called Love of Christ Christian Fellowship. They let us use the building. And so the first Saturday of every month, and that would include this coming Saturday, we have a morning meeting just for men, a men's Bible study, and an evening meeting for anybody. You're welcome to come. And that too is a Q&A meeting. And both are in the same location. It's a little church in Temecula, and if you want to know where that is, and join us this Saturday, either in the morning or in the evening or both, uh, you can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, and look under Announcements, and that's where you'll find all the information you need. Okay, so um, let's talk next 
to uh, John from Port Townsend. Uh, that'd be uh, that's in Washington, isn't it? Yes, it is. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Well, I've got a couple of questions, or back-to-back type things. And but first, I really like to tell you that uh, last year there were not very many high points, but your radio and web ministry is is awesome. Um, it helped get through a whole lot of things, and I, I love the way you glorify God and all the things you do. So thank you for all that. Well, I'm glad so to hear. So I've thank gone you. through your website a bunch of times and a lot of lectures, and I'm going through church history again. And one of the questions I had is when they get to all the the persecution and all the different people that were persecuted, and then getting to the Anabaptists, were there any uh, suggestions that Anabaptists or any of those kind of groups persecuted other Christians? No. And after that is if you were looking for a group now that kind of was more relevant to the original Anabaptist uh, theology, where would you look, or are we pretty much in, you're going to be starting a home church and trying to find like-minded people or you know, teaching that kind of way. I'm trying well, to get away from the Calvinism and the yeah. institutionalized church. Yeah. Well, there are, there, are, there are Anabaptist groups, um, denominations. I mean, the uh, Mennonites are Anabaptists, and the Amish are Anabaptists, and the Hutterites are, those are the main uh, Anabaptist denominations, the largest of which would be the Mennonites, I guess. Uh, but I will say this. Mennonites, uh, although they, they are the direct descendants of the original Anabaptist movement, uh, not every Mennonite church is going to represent them that well, just because so many centuries have gone by, a lot of traditions. Uh, I've been in a Mennonite church uh, and have many Mennonite friends, but I'll just say the, the Mennonite denominations, just like the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians and every other one, have in some cases gone liberal. There are liberal Mennonite churches. Uh, which would you wouldn't find much in common with. Now, the ones that have not become literal, <clears throat> Mennonite people are some of the sweetest people you ever meet, uh, and I, I love I love them. The ones I met, though sometimes they can be a little legalistic, and that's just because they want to please the Lord and they've had long-standing traditions about certain things, <clears throat> like women ha- wearing something on their head or wear- women wearing long dresses and things like that. Now, not all Mennonite groups are like that. Uh, there are very contemporary-looking Mennonite groups. Uh, but you just have to, I'm just saying not all Mennonites are alike, and certainly not all of them have the spirit of the original Anabaptist. But Mennonites and Amish and Hutterites are denominations that are that sprang directly from uh, the uh, Anabaptist movement. Now, there are also non-denominational churches that where the pastors and congregations are uh, fairly anabaptistic in their in their orientation, but I I couldn't tell you which ones they are. That that'd be more on an individual church basis, and and I honestly don't know what's in your area that might be like that. Uh, so they're having, fairly rare, I would assume. Uh, well, they they are. I mean, uh, yeah, or I don't know how rare they are. You know, if they, if they're independent churches that aren't affiliated with other churches. They just reflect the, you know, the, the attitudes and the beliefs of the pastors and so forth. Uh, I, I'd have no way of keeping track of those around the country or even in, in, in Washington. But uh, you did ask, did the Mennonites ever persecute anyone? In the very early days, there was a, a group called the Munsterites, which were uh, technically Anabaptists because they believed in rebaptism. That is, they believed in baptizing converts rather than babies. And that was, of course, the big distinctive of the original Anabaptists. But but the Munsterites didn't have the same spirit as any other uh, uh, Anabaptists. Anabaptists were very gentle people. They were usually called the quiet of the land. They were very uh, pacifist, uh, very nonviolent people. And you'd, you'd never find, uh, you know, Anabaptists hurting anybody. Or even they didn't even believe in fighting in war, or being policemen. They just didn't want to do anything that was violent, and uh, and they were martyred in great numbers, and uh, and sometimes they would even save the lives of people who were seeking to kill them. Uh, and yes, here's your story about the yeah going across the ice and then the right. executioner falls in the ice and he gets exactly. saved by the guy he kills. <laughs> exactly. So the idea yeah. of Mennonites, or the, the idea of Anabaptists, uh, you know, killing anyone 
like most of the other denominations did at one time or another, at least the yeah. earlier ones. Um, uh, I shouldn't say most of them. Most denominations have never killed anyone, but a lot of them did. Um, the, Anabaptists would never do such a thing as that. But the Munsterites, uh, the fact that they believed in rebaptism is the only connection they had with the Anabaptists. They were, they were a, 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 an end, an eschatological cult. They believed that Jesus was coming soon. They 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 waged war, physical warfare against uh, their adversaries outside their city. Uh, their leader was, uh, you know, an immoral man and a power hungry man. That's totally unlike other Anabaptists. This, unfortunately, when people are not Anabaptists, they sometimes try to characterize the Anabaptist movement uh, by appeal to the Munsterites, who were not really anything like the mainstream Anabaptists in any way. Mainstream Anabaptists were very pleasant people. Well, that, that's what I got. And I just, I don't know, I have this thing. If, if you're willing to burn people at the stake, it's going to make me question other things you have to say. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I thank you so much for your answer. And uh, please keep, keep up the good work. And I appreciate it all. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, John. God bless you, too. Uh, our next caller is from Dave from Forest Grove, Oregon. Dave, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. <laughs> Thank you for taking my call. Uh -huh. It's been good listening to you, Steve. Um, Thank you. We were having a Bible study, and, and during the study, we were talking about how the Spirit works. And we also got talking about how evil spirits work, where there is influence on some and possession on others, both in the Holy Spirit and in evil spirits. And I wondered if you could share some verses that might relate to that um, and help us. About how they work? Answer off the air. Well, how is, there are some people I believe that are influenced by evil spirits. Yes. And other people that are influenced by the Holy Spirit, which okay. are brought to certain places, and, and there are people that are actually serving those spirits. Right. Okay. I'll be glad and to discuss that. Thank okay. You. The Thank you. Thank okay. You. Well, the, one of the problems is we don't have many verses about uh, demon possession other than stories about the demon possessed. Uh, there's not much said about them except in relating cases of Jesus or the apostles encountering demon possessed people and cast them out. So we don't have anything like didactic teaching about them. Probably the closest thing we have is something Jesus said in Matthew 12 uh, when he was actually using this as, a, as an analogy to what would happen to his generation in AD 70, but he compared his nation with a man who had a demon and that the demon was cast out and then he brought more back with him. And uh, so, but this is this teaching about his generation of the Jews is put in a form of a something of a teaching about demons. It's in Matthew twelve forty three, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. So he doesn't say how the demon ever got in there in the first place, but he starts with the case that a man was demon possessed and he he was delivered. He, the demon goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. Uh, it then says, "I will return to my house, where I from which I came." And uh, when he comes, he finds it s empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation, he said. Now, that's not much teaching. Uh, I mean, we have a lot, of, a lot more curiosity than we have teaching about this subject. Uh, and there's no teaching uh, among the epistles about the phenomenon of demon possession. Uh, there's reference to demons, and there's reference to spiritual warfare, and there's reference to the devil, but the phenomenon of demon possession simply isn't brought up in the epistles. We find it mainly anecdotally described in uh, the Gospels and Acts, which makes it difficult for me to find a scripture that would give the answers for that. But uh, in general, I, I, can, I can give you some, uh, this will be, I have to say, some things we know and maybe some possible extrapolation from things we know. Uh, and that is that there is to be a, a difference made, a distinction made between the brain as a physical organ and the mind, which is the, one, one might just equate it with the soul. 
uh, the mind is, of course, what I believe, what I think. My mind is my opinions and my beliefs and, uh, and my choices and so forth. That's the activity of my mind. Now, my mind interacts with my brain because when I'm thinking, my brain is doing things. It's, you know, there's synapses in the brain that are going on that are physical, just as physical as when my stomach is digesting food or when my liver is filtering things, or when my lungs are inflating and deflating. We have all these physical organs that do physical things, and the brain is a physical organ that does physical things. But uh, it, is, it is not the case that the brain can account for all thought. Of course, the brain gives orders to the nervous system and so forth, but, but the decisions, those are involuntary, like the brain keeps you breathing or keeps your heart beating while you're uh, when you're asleep or something. That's involuntary actions that the brain does physically. But then it's also involved in thinking and believing and loving and hating, so emotions. And a lot of that is uh, is not chemical, is not physical. Uh, there are synapses related with it and parts of the brain that are uh, illuminate, illuminated in a brain scan for different emotions and so forth. But it cannot be shown that those that brain activity is causing the emotions. We don't know that the emotions are not dictating the brain activity. The the brain mind barrier is a, is a very hard thing to cross. We don't know. Ex I mean, there's mysteries about the human human soul and about uh, that the Bible simply doesn't really address. Uh, the Bible talks about the heart of man, meaning sort of the same thing: the the, the brain, the inter the internal workings of the soul. Uh, and it tells us a lot about the heart. And it does tell us we need to keep our heart with all diligence, it says in Proverbs 4, uh, 18. For out of it, I think it's 18, for out of it are the issues of life. And so our life actions are dictated by what's in our heart, not our physical heart, any more than the physical brain. It's, it's, these are metaphors. The mind, the brain, I excuse me, the mind, the heart, the soul, these are metaphors for the non-physical person, personality, and uh, character. I mean, my character determines what I'll think about. If I, if I want to get, when I get off the air, if I want to look at pornography, that's not my brain telling me to do that. That's my bad character. If I want to read my Bible, that's not my brain telling me to do that. That's, my, that's me telling my brain what we're going to do. And it's, it's a very mysterious thing. Now, the reason I mention this is because I believe the soul is a non-physical aspect of our humanness. And I believe the demons seek to affect our soul as, as I believe the Holy Spirit does seek to affect our soul, for our mind. For example, the Holy Spirit will convict a person. Uh, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, that would be non-Christians being affected by the Spirit, being convicted by the Spirit, but not necessarily being inhabited by the Spirit. What Jesus said about a demon going out of a man and bringing back seven more suggests that demons actually can come and live inside of people and he referred to them as their house, just like where the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, a person's body apparently can be the house of demonic spirits. But not everybody has to be demon-possessed in order for the demons to have an effect on them, just like a person doesn't have to be a Christian with the Spirit living in them in order for the Holy Spirit to convict them and have influence on them. So uh, I believe that demons are, you know, they're, of course, very much unlike the Holy Spirit, but they are like the Holy Spirit in that they are spirits, and they are in the spiritual realm. And it's the spiritual realm that interacts, I think, with the spiritual aspect of our personality, which would be the heart of the mind, and uh, not the physical brain. And there's not much talk, not much said about these things in the Bible. The Bible doesn't really... Um, explain things that we might think should be very clearly explained for us because they're so interesting. But I, my thought is that uh, spirits are not part of the physical world. And our soul, although it's connected to the physical world through our body, I think that uh, I think we leave our bodies when we die. Paul talked about being absent from the body. Paul even talked about having a vision in which he said he didn't know if he was in the body or out of the body. So spiritual experiences can apparently at times be totally independent of, of the body, which would include the brain. Uh, but most people don't have out-of-body experiences, and except perhaps at death. The point I'm making is this, that we have a non-physical, spiritual aspect to our humanness besides our body. 
And the demons and the Holy Spirit are living in that spiritual realm too, and apparently have ways of communicating as, as you and I can communicate with our ears and our mouths with each other or write letters to each other and communicate. Spirits have their own ways of communicating that are never explained to us, but a demonic spirit can communicate, uh, can introduce thoughts to a person and, uh, and a person can succumb to them and, and, and agree with them. Or like Jesus can say, get behind me, Satan. You know, your thoughts are an offense. You're an offense to me. Uh, we, can, we can put away or resist or fight off satanic and demonic thoughts. But there are people who've done things that have actually given the spirits entry into their lives. Just like people can fight off the Holy Spirit's conviction. But there are people who surrender the Holy Spirit and he comes and lives inside them. And the spirit living inside has much more uh, control and much more influence than spirits on the outside just making suggestions. I mean, I can tell you what I think you should do. And that's just my mind communicating with your mind. That's, but if I was a demon instead of my, my soul, if it was a demon, it could communicate with your mind too. But externally, it's not inside of you. It's not living inside of you. But there are people in whom demons and, and evil spirits live. And we don't have as much information laid out in scriptures we'd like on that. I do have, though I, it, it won't answer your specific question that you made on the air, but it may interest you. There is a, there are a couple lectures at our website in, under the individual lecture category uh, about demons. And uh, pretty much all we know about demons from the Bible would be covered in those couple lectures, I think. Wish I could do better. I wish I knew more. But, uh, you know, I guess God doesn't think we need to know as much as we'd like to know. Dale from Sacramento, California. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Uh, hello, brother. Uh, my question today has to do with these four words and whether they are even in the Bible. Those four words are, once saved, always saved. Because this those, is those words, of... That phrase is not in the Bible, no. That phrase is not in the okay, Bible. Okay, because it has, the Baptists have a tendency to, to uh, strictly adhere to those four words, and it... And that's yeah, what I wanted I, to do. I wanted to clarify that. Okay. Well, I was raised Baptist myself, and I'm very familiar with those four words, once saved, always saved. It's, uh, it's a way of uh, stating what they call the doctrine of eternal security. Um, I would refer to it as the doctrine of unconditional eternal security, because I believe in eternal security, but not unconditionally. I believe we are eternally secure as we trust in Christ. Uh, as we abide in Christ, and that we have we have every opportunity and uh, you know choice to do just that. We can abide in Christ, and if we abide in Him eternally, which is an option which we should be choosing, then we are eternally secure. But eternal security sometimes is phrased as if even if you don't abide in Christ, you're still secure, and I, we'd refer to that as unconditional uh, eternal security. And the Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. But that's really kind of what is often associated with the terms once saved, always saved, because you find somebody who was a Christian for a while, and then they walked away from God, and they're not a Christian now. They're an atheist now or something. And, and they're, uh, you know, the, the preacher still tells their mother, who's concerned for their soul, oh, once saved, always saved. He, he was saved when he was in, a kid in Sunday school, so he'll still go to heaven. Uh, that's a very dangerous doctrine. Certainly doesn't have a line of Scripture in its support. But that we are eternally secure in Christ, as we continue eternally to abide in Christ, that's conditional eternal security. And like everything else in a relationship with anybody, including God, there are conditions. In fact, a person isn't a Christian at all unless they meet the condition of faith, nor do they remain a Christian if they don't continue uh, to meet the condition of faith. So uh, once saved, always saved is uh, a, a term I don't really feel very comfortable with because I think it has, uh, it, it, can be, it can mean something very misleading. All right, let's talk to Russ from Las Vegas, Nevada. Russ, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yeah, hi, Steve. Great show. Thanks. Uh, what would you say to somebody who is absolutely devastated by the fact that the raising of Lazarus appears in only one gospel? It just seems to be such an incredibly significant uh, event that it's hard for him to get his mind around the fact that Matthew doesn't mention it and Luke doesn't mention it and Peter never mentioned it to Mark or whatever. Uh, just, well, you know, but, uh, Ma Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all mention the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead, 
And Luke mentions, I think it's Luke, maybe Mark, I think it's Luke mentions the raising of the son of the widow of uh, Nain, a, a town called Nain, and a dead son was raised. And, and Jesus, even when he sent out the 12 uh, on short-term missions, you know, in Matthew 10 and, and Luke 10, uh, he tells them to raise the dead, tells them heal the sick, raise the dead, do all this stuff. So, I mean, there must have been, you know, a number of people who who were raised from the dead. And the gospel writers do not uh, seek to tell us everything Jesus did. He must have worked thousands of miracles in his ministry because sometimes it says he went through the cities healing all their sick and casting out all the demons and so forth. So you know, there were at least hundreds of miracles Jesus did. Some of them included raising the dead. All the gospels record Jesus raising the dead. Um, like I said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us about uh, Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead by Jesus, but they don't tell us about Lazarus. Um, Lazarus, or John's gospel tells us about Lazarus, but doesn't talk about Jairus' daughter and doesn't talk about the widow of Nain. So it's the question has got to, it's not a problem question. It's just a question of, you know, what purpose did John have in writing and, and in selecting the material he selected? And what purpose did the other gospels have in writing and selecting the material they have. Anyone who's going to write a historical account or a biography, they're going to have to choose which things they include and which things they don't. There's sure. just too too many things done in a person's lifetime uh, that you couldn't write them all down. In fact, even John said that. John said that at the end of his gospel, or at the end of chapter 20, he said, if all the things Jesus said uh, were written down, the world itself couldn't, couldn't contain it. Couldn't it. So, the books of right, the world so, couldn't contain it. Right, so so neither John nor the other gospel writers had any interest in writing everything Jesus did, but they were giving samples of things that Jesus did, and if they and they all wanted people to know that Jesus rose the de- raised the dead because all four gospels record him doing it. It's just different cases. Now they were all important. I, I agree, the raising of Lazarus is a very important point uh, miracle, but so was the raising of Jairus's daughter, and that's left out of John. Uh, I think. I think one thing that people don't understand is that John was written later than the other Gospels. And it was written, no doubt, for the purpose of filling in details that the others had left out. So that John's, the miracles in John, apart from the feeding of the 5,000, which is in all four Gospels, the other miracles that John records, none of them are found in the other Gospels. And none of the other Gospels, yeah, and none of the other Gospels, uh, well, Matthew and John both record Jesus walking on water, but Mark and Luke don't, and that seems like an important thing, too. But the sure. point is, John's gospel includes dialogues, sermons, and miracles that are not found in any of the other gospels. And that, in fact, it, it's primarily filled with such things. And it has the appearance of being a document that was not written to reinvent the wheel, which had already been done by Matthew, Mark, and Luke before John wrote. But uh, as in his old age, John, I think, was wanting to write uh, memoirs of his life with Jesus and include the things that had been left out of the other Gospels. Sure. That, would be, that would explain it. It sounds great. That, thank All you right. so much. Appreciate okay, it. Russ. Thank you. God bless you. Bye. Bye now. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are on Monday through Friday doing just what we did today. If you've never listened to us before, well make it a point. We're on every weekday at the same time. We are listener supported and we do buy the time on the radio stations. There's no stations giving us this time for free. Although some stations are generous enough to play the program late at night a second time without additional charge. But we do have to pay for the first time. And uh, we don't have anything for sale. We don't have commercials. Uh, We don't have sponsors. We just are listener supported. You can go to our website thenarrowpath.com if you're interested and see how to donate if you want, or just take the resources there that are free at thenarrowpath.com. And let's talk again tomorrow. God bless you.